Hello everyone. Um, those of you who were fortunate enough to be at the LGBT seminar uh, in Birmingham this year will remember some of these uh, slides, um, but I have expanded it slightly. Um, to introduce myself, uh, I'm Emily Harford and uh, just recently received massive awesome promotion. So I am now the principal engineer um, working for the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Um, and my job uh, primarily was designing nuclear robots, which means in my head, um, these, these big guys are from Pacific Rim, uh, but in reality, uh, not. Um, my, um, my background is in mechanical engineering and I've got about 10 years of uh, industry experience. Um, as I say, I now, now work for the Office of the Chief Engineer, um, which means I'll be sticking my nose in other people's business uh, instead of getting on with my own job. Um, although previously I was in remote applications in challenging environments, um, which is race, um, and uh, hilarious friends of mine uh, love pointing out that um, that made me a racist, uh, which is particularly difficult when you're trying to pay attention and you, you know that you probably are. Um, I'm married to a priest. Um, she's next door doing her job. And if you want to follow me on Twitter for uh, abuse, uh, trans allyship, um, swearing and, and possibly cats, uh, please do so. All right, let's start with an introduction to fusion um, because we say STEM and we, we, we have the sort of generalized notions of science. Um, what I pointed out at the LGBT seminar is that the letters actually stand for different things. Um, the E there is engineering, and that's, that's my gig, but the, the science in itself is still quite broad. Uh, some of you might even be biologists, um, and I'm sorry for that. Um, when we're doing, talking about fusion, um, this is the process that happens in the sun, and the idea is that you take two things and you squish them together really hard, and you squish them together so hard that they become the same thing. Um, in the sun, it, it's this like proton, proton, and then hydrogen, hydrogen, and then some other stuff. It's all a bit grubby and mucky. And the reason the sun gets anything done at all is because it's been around for literally 4 billion years. Um, the, only the only way we get anything done on Earth is by being better at it. Um, and um, that's, that's primarily by doing it hotter, but also by doing it with some slightly more sensible um, at, atomy elementy things. Um, so at UK AEA we use uh, tritium and deuterium which give us a helium and a neutron. Um, following on from jet uh, will be ITER um, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. When you're looking at um, how a tokamak goes together Tokamak, incidentally, um, is an acronym, but it's a Russian one, so I don't know what it stands for. Um, but you can Google that later. So the idea is that you use magnets to, to squish everything a lot. Um, jet uses copper magnets, which means that the plasma pulses are very short. Um, it's just, just the nature of uh, things. Um, and you, you have magnets in a range of orientations. So you've got ones spinning around the outside. Those are the outer poloidal field coils. You've got the toroidal ones that squish it into a donut shape. Um, and tokamaks, plasma tokamaks, they come in um, different shapes as well. So you, you should, rec I recommend Googling Stellarator. That stuff is mega bonkers and is made to upset engineers almost exclusively. Um, the whole point of what we're trying to do is, is to make um, fusion uh, less of just um, exciting pictures for physicists and more useful for everyone. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the research pathway. So we've got, we've got JET, which on this uh, picture looks super tiny, but you can see um, tiny guy tiny guy. So that gives you an idea of scale. Jet is, is herself quite large. Um, it's a built in, being built in the south of France, um, substantially larger. 
um, and the difference in size should should provide a difference in um, in energy output. So Jet, even though she's a world record breaker, her energy output is about 67% of what we put in. Um, when we get back to doing our campaign, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's some stuff going on right now that means we all have to stay at home and Jet isn't very portable, so we've left her in the office. Um, when we go back to the campaign, we're hoping that we'll, we'll start pushing into sort of 70%. But I don't know um, if you notice that's still not actually more out than you put in. Um, ITER, because of the increased size, um, will produce about 10 times more energy out than it takes in. And the pulse is because the magnets there are superconductors. Shout out to Clara Barker, thanks very much. Um, that, those pulses will run for about 20 minutes. So ITER is absolutely going to smash those records out of the out of the park, but none of that energy is going onto the grid. Still only toys for physicists, not useful. So the next stage after that is to start um, making power plants that are connected to something. Uh, so the two that the UK AEA are contributing to are um, DEMO, which is short for Demonstration Power Plant, um, and is sort of a misnomer as there is more than one worldwide. So there's a Eurofusion demo, which is sort of the EU and us and some other people. Um, and also Japan are working on demo, South Korea are working on demo, um, China are working on demo, Russia and the USA, all of them are working on their own version of demo because all of those countries have been involved in the development of ITER. Um, the, other, the other effort to put um, energy on the grid is STEP. That's a UK solo effort, um, which has just been approved for its second sort of concept design year. So it's really early stages, but um, STEP in the glory of acronyms that we all love is um, spherical tokamak for energy production. Um, and the, the hope for that is that it will start putting energy on the grid um, this century which even that sounds um, a, a bit ambitious sometimes, but we're working really hard on it. Okay, here's why it's really hard. And I, I've broken it down into the simplest possible terms. Um, you're trying to put a star in a box. Um, and that in itself should be, sh should be enough of a challenge. Um, the, the sun, our, our sun uh, has surface temperatures of 5,000 degrees sort of fine. In the centre it's about 15 million. Jet is running at 150 million. Um, so trying to trying to put a star in a box and have a temperature gradient you don't find anywhere else in the universe, um, if you've got your superconducting magnets like a metre away from your 150 million degree plasma, um, that's, I mean, I, I could stop there. Um, actually, could I stop there? Then, then we have other things. So we have neutrons. So I mentioned earlier that you, you squish your tritium and your deuterium and you get a helium uh, and a neutron. And those neutrons are, are not ideal. Um, then we get radio, radiation and then we get the, the frankly tedious um, business of, of keeping the whole thing working. Because just like any other industrial plant, it needs um, scheduled maintenance and so on. Okay, here's this tritium deuterium, but with some extra numbers written on it. So you get, um, you get, you smash your deuterium and your tritium together, you get a helium and a neutron that pings on out. And that neutron um, is, is doing a fair pace. The reason, the reason the neutron is important is it's how you get the energy out of your reactor and make your water hot because despite the fact of fusion energy being the, the energy of the future, it's still really steampunk. You still, the only way you get electric out at the moment is you make your water hot and you turn a turbine, just like burning dead trees. Um, we haven't moved on from that. The other thing is that um, deuterium it, kicking around at about 10% of all hydrogen on earth, it's, it's all over the place. 
uh, you can't move for it. But tritium is not naturally occurring. And at the moment, we're getting it out of uh, Canadian molten salt reactors as a byproduct. But we, if we want to use deuterium tritium as our fusion fuel, we need tritium all the time. So that neutron, energy out. And if you smash that neutron into some lithium, you get some more helium and a tritium. And it, you need that tritium. You have to have it. On the other hand, neutrons ruin everything. They ruin everything. They sm like this, this 14.1 mega electron volts, you throw that into any conventional material and that material will go <laughs> um, as you can see by these pretty pictures on over here. Now, what you can see is that everything moves and goes back, but not quite the way it did before. So over time, um, the neutron bombardment of your materials makes them brittle and uh, ruins their structural integrity. Um, and when we're talking about um, reactors like DEMO, structural integrity is going to be a big part of making sure it stays working. Okay, let's do radiation and all of the things uh, that it ruins. It impedes your control. It physically damages control and instrumentation equipment, it degrades optics and microelectronics, it causes noise and corrupts your data, you have to control for contamination, you cannot send people in there, and that is a slice of what demo is going to look like in theory because it doesn't exist. Um, because demo is still in the design stages, we still have to design the shielding that you're going to need in. Um, so this, this, so I'm going to just, this bit in the middle, that's where the plasma is going to be. This is, this is your red hot area, red hot in terms of radiation and actual temperature. So your, your plasma's here and then on the edge, that's, that's the, the wall of the vessel. And then as you move away from where the plasma is, you're still getting extremely high um, radiation fluxes. Um, Eight gray is a fatal dose, uh, as I understand it. So for your context, um, even in this area, you, you, you cannot send any people, they will die. Right. This is to remind me to talk about chemical engineering. Do not look at this picture. In fact, here's my cat. Now, for the last six months, I've been supporting the chemical and process plant engineering at UK AEA on secondment. Um, and I just wanted to, um, in an extension of my talk that I did earlier in the year, uh, explain that um, even things that are relatively well understood, like process plant to handle flammable or explosive gases, still isn't straightforward when you, when you make it radioactive. So tritium is not just explosive, just like all of the other hydrogens. It's a bit radioactive. Don't breathe that stuff. Um, or can you breathe it? I think it maybe it's the beryllium you can't breathe. Either way, don't touch it. It's also really rare, so you don't want it wandering off. Um, and because of Chernobyl, uh, the public feel a bit weird about radioactive um, releases for some reason. Um, and if you told them that you've just released all of your tritium up the stack, they're going to be very unhappy even if you've done the math to prove that it can't hurt them. I mean, as I hadn't even really thought until I started supporting um, process plant, how you store tritium. I assumed it was in gas bottles. Turns out it's on beds of depleted uranium. So add that into um, your security and storage issues. All right, now the bit that's technically my specialism. If you put all of the rest of it aside, the fact that everything's radioactive, the fact that neutrons are ruining everything, that you still need to work with chemical engineers, and that physicists are trying to make things that do, mm, the whole thing has to work. This image here shows, um, it's, a, it's a render of the inside of JET. Um, she was finished for the first time in, in 1985 and was not designed with remote handling in mind, because it didn't exist then. 
The manipulator there shown is called mascot, which is an Italian acronym, and you can Google it later. To get into the vessel, um, mascot is turned on its side with its arms over its head, like Superman, and pushed through a port which has literally centimeters of clearance. Um, and then it's on the end of an ex extremely long boom um, that can curve round 195 degrees of uh, the torus that gives you access to all of it. Mascot is going to be extremely important because in our next round of uh, experiments, when we start doing DT again, the, the amount of um, activation that's going to be caused by the neutrons is going to, um, it's going to ruin everything um, for people. Um, and once again, jet is going to be um, completely, um, completely off limits. Um, so mascot is completely essential, even for something so small. When you're thinking about remote maintenance right at the beginning, you need to start, you need to include right at the start before you do anything else, what your standard mechanical features are. Um, standard electrical and control connections. You have to consider your space for access and for the tools you need to take with you. And above all, this has to be time and cost, cost efficient. There's no point in engineers providing a solution if we're Archimedes and his method of moving the world. Elite, for those of you, that's give me a lever long enough and a place to stand. It, it, has, to, it has to be feasible. So you can see here on this image that it's a two part, it's a two part mating process on this. So um, the, first, the first part to engage has a ball head on it to, so that you can um, lock out two axes of motion without um, uh, wedging. Wedging is what you're trying to avoid. And then when you get to that taper, it gently brings it into uh, alignment to prevent the wedging and then you bring in a second tape of the lockout, the last section of rotation. Um, and that's not, that's not difficult to consider, but you have to know that it needs to be there at the start. Okay, and then we start talking about the scale of the issue. So um, you saw earlier that we had Jet, who looks teeny weeny, little polka dot, tokamak, right at the start. Then we got Itter, and then Demo, an order of mag, you know, again, bigger. These um, removable blanket segments, these these guys, they have to be um, they have to be taken out every few years um, to be replaced, um, so that the machine can continue running. But that 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 purple section highlighted there, that weighs eighty tons, and under that sort of load, it will deform itself under its own mass. So somehow, without being able to see clearly because the radiation ruins everything, without being able to control it properly because the radiation ruins everything, you have to design this absolute glorious monstrosity, multi-axis crane that can lift that monstrous jiggly banana. <laughs> and again, even though we knew about this in, in advance, it is with centimeters of clearance because the ports have to stay small for the reasons of shielding but you still we still have to you know we still have to make make these changes okay so those blanket segments are um filled with pipes i talked about how you're using your night your your neutron to make tritium and those blanket segments are filled with pipes and in this, we're installing a new pipe cassette because we've just replaced the blankets. So these pipe cuffs, they make an alignment, isn't that great? But lower down, we have to make a weld. Those pipes have to be joined. And I worked on this welding tool. Um, and I didn't have this video in Birmingham, so I hope you're enjoying it. Um, And this is uh, this tool is a laser welder. In this video, it is the smaller size set of demo pipes. Um, so what's being welded here is a, a pipe of approximately um, 80 millimeter diameter and five millimeter wall thickness. 
Um, and the reason it's got those um, extra bits around the edge is to help with alignment, but also to prevent um, uh, the laser um, damaging the rest of the plant, because um, I don't want to be the person who put a laser hole in a tokamak. This welding tool has a buddy. It also has a cutting tool, which is also um, laser, laser founded. But somehow, um, despite it being apparently impossible in industry, we found a way to send a, a laser worm in a into a tube um, and weld a pipe together. Um, but it gets uh, even more fun because there are two pipe sizes. So we have to uh, find a way of taking that tool and make, and make it able to weld 15 millimeters um, with a laser without being able to see or control it or touch it. Um, and that means that you might have to do multiple passes. And if um, anyone, anyone who uh, works with lasers can tell you, you cannot twist uh, a fiber optic cable. So we're gonna have to find a way of getting around that. Um, still, that, this project was a great deal of fun for me. Okay, onto the, onto the, like the real thing about, like I've talked about how hard this is. It's just, you know, what, I, I'd say I should just go home, but I am, um, as is everyone I work with, for some reason, can't think why. Um, but, you know, is this worth it? It's a lot of effort. There is no long enough radioactive waste. Like Chernobyl without intervention will be here for as long as uh, human civilization has yet existed. Um, I uh, give a talk to graduate engineers on engineering ethics and I um, reference in that the Code of Hammurabi, uh, which is quite a lot BCE. Um, but even that, it's not even close to how long Chernobyl would be hanging around, but it just doesn't happen in uh, fusion energy. The, the recycling, uh, the waste from fusion is ready to re-enter conventional um, use again within um, hundreds, not tens of thousands of years. Um, for the purposes of humanity, it is effectively an infinite fuel supply. Um, if, if the breeder blankets uh, work to produce um, tritium the way uh, expected, half a bathtub of seawater and the lithium in my mobile phone battery would produce all of the energy I need for the next 40 years, um, which sounds effectively infinite to me. Um, there are no CO2 emissions, although obviously there will be some in construction. Um, so even though we're a bit late for climate change, we can prevent things from uh, getting worse uh, as uh, things move on. And it's inherently safe. Um, if you stop controlling the reaction in a fusion reactor, it will fall over. That's all it does, it just, it just falls over. You'll break the machine at worst, um, but it'll collapse like a souffle when you open the oven door too early. Okay, let's talk about money. Gosh, isn't that a lot of money? Gosh, so expensive. Although, I'm just saying in terms of priorities um, and the cost of it, it does include um, paying uh, people for their labor. Okay, so I said we're too late to impact climate change, um, but we are, experiencing massive population growth. Um, why has it done that? Um, the, this, this graph um, is sort of a, a prediction as, as you know, our population is closing in hard on that 10 billion number. The, the demand for energy is increasing as well. So, because it's sort of a statistical prediction, there are three different curves it can follow. Um, but however you're looking at that, you're still looking at almost doubling the amount of energy that humanity wants. Um, so, so we need to find a way of producing more energy. Um, and if we don't find a way of doing that without ruining the only planet we have available, 
um, we're in real trouble. Um, I mean, it is the biggest engineering challenge of all time. I mean, the ISS, relatively easy, putting someone on the moon, this is all this is all stuff that was that is easier than what 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 I try to do with my colleagues at work. Um, we are worryingly smart people, or at least stubborn. I genuinely believe um, that it will change uh, the human species, um, the way that the advent of writing or the wheel or the internet uh, change the way we interact with each other. Uh, I read a quote uh, from an anthropologist um, earlier today asking for what like the first uh, indication of, of civilization was. Um, and it's, um, she said it was um, a healed femur, a healed broken femur. Um, because if you break your leg and you're alone, that's, that's pretty much it, especially if you've broken your femur. But if you're able to, if, if your femur has healed, it means somebody helped you. Um, and I, I agree that the best sign of a civilization is, is, the, is helping each other. Um, and I think fusion energy will enable us to do that like um, never before. So I hope you guys liked that. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs>